Glioblastoma has received a lot of hype in the news lately now that Senator John McCain has been recently diagnosed with this type of primary brain tumor. As you can tell by the numbers, this week's episode is a bit out of order. It was originally planned to air in October, but in light of recent events, we thought we'd publish it sooner so you would know what it actually means that Senator McCain has a glioblastoma. To give you a bit of clinical background on McCain, or at least the history that we can tell, he initially presented with intermittent double vision and fatigue. This might not have been terribly concerning in an overworked senator these days. And there was also an interesting instance in the Comey hearing on June 8th, where Senator John McCain wasn't quite making perfect sense. At first, he confuses Comey for Trump, and then later goes on to say this about Hillary Clinton. And obviously, she was a candidate for president at the time, so she was clearly involved in this whole situation where fake news, uh, as you just described it, big deal, uh, took place. And, uh, you, you're going to have to help me out here. In other words, we're complete. The investigation of anything that former Secretary Clinton had to do with the campaign is over and we don't have to worry about it anymore. To which Comey responds. With respect to Secretary, I'm not, I'm, I'm a little confused, Senator. With respect to Secretary Clinton, yeah. we investigated criminal investigation and connection. So Comey also loses track of McCain's thought process here. And anyone else, I might say they might have lost track of their thoughts interviewing an extremely powerful FBI director. But for John McCain, I'd say this was some kind of a mild fluent aphasia, perhaps in the setting of a complex partial seizure that could have originated in the left hemisphere, precisely where his glioblastoma lies. Or it might have been nothing at all. But later, with McCain's new double vision, his doctor ordered a head CT that identified a 5 centimeter quote, blood clot over his left eye. Neither McCain nor his staff have specified what kind of clot it was, but some speculate it may have actually been a subdural hematoma, or it could have been a cavernous sinus thrombosis. Still unclear what it was. But the pathology report from the resected tissue confirmed features of a glioblastoma, a hypercellular tissue with pseudopalisading necrosis, nuclear atypia, and a high degree of mitotic activity. You might recall that Senator Ted Kennedy was diagnosed with the same tumor after experiencing a seizure in 2008, and he passed away within 15 months of symptoms. So it's a very aggressive disease. And you're going to hear all about it over the next half hour when Brainwaves continues. Support for this episode of Brainwaves and the following message was brought to you by Audible, the internet's largest collection of ad-free audiobooks. Among them is John McCain's historical account, 13 Soldiers, A Personal History of Americans at War, narrated by the author himself. You can listen to this audiobook for free by going to audibletrial.com slash brainwaves. I'd first like to start off by talking about a patient I saw in neuro-oncology clinic who described the day he received the diagnosis of his brain tumor as the day the sky fell in. This is Dr. Nina Chariel, a neurology resident with a special interest in neuro-oncology, and she works with me in Philadelphia. Any cancer diagnosis can be devastating, but malignant central nervous system tumors such as glioblastoma multiforme, or GBM, in particular carry an alarmingly poor prognosis. The median survival is 12 to 14 months, with less than 10% of patients surviving two years from time of diagnosis. Despite these striking statistics, there is more hope than ever for the treatment of this deadly disease as clinical research uncovers specific gene signatures of each tumor, leading to a more targeted and personalized treatment options. To prove it to you, I've asked our beloved expert in neuro-oncology, Dr. Amy Pruitt, to join us today. Dr. Pruitt, thank you for being here. Beloved in neuro-oncology don't tend to occur in the same phrase very often, but thank you very much. <laughs> So in, in answer to uh, your patient's issues, I would have to say that indeed this is an era in which for the first time there is significant hope for people who have the most common of malignant tumors of the central nervous system or glioblastoma. But before we even dive into all these subtle nuances of glioblastoma, let's take a step back. And Nina, let me ask you this very basic question. What is a glioblastoma and how does this type of glial tumor relate to all the other nerve cells in the human brain? Sure. So of malignant tumors that arise from the brain parenchyma, 80% of them are descended from glial cells, or what I like to call the glue between the neurons. 
Normal glial cells include oligodendrocytes, which, as you know, provide support and insulation to neuronal axons, ependymone cells, which make CSF, the fluid that the brain and spinal cord float in, as well as astrocytes, which perform a variety of critical functions around the brain, including maintenance of the blood-brain barrier, repair after trauma, and a lot of extracellular neuronal homeostasis. Glioblastomas are derived from this last cell type, or astrocytes. Unlike the majority of other life-threatening solid organ tumors, these masses are locally destructive, but rarely ever metastasize outside of the CNS. There are certain GBMs that are multifocal glioblastomas um, spread throughout the brain, and these usually pretend a much poorer prognosis. So I think we should probably talk about the history of glioma classification, which changed last year uh, for the fourth iteration. So this is, is actually really a major difference. The World Health Organization updated uh, the classification of gliomas, the most common type of brain tumor, into a integrated phenotypic and genotypic classification so that instead of just having a histologic diagnosis of an astrocytoma or an anaplastic astrocytoma or an oligodendroglioma or glioblastoma, you're going to see the cell type along with some very important markers. The genomic analysis has revealed several molecular markers that are associated with prognosis and also with the durability of response to our available chemotherapy. So what we now have are glioblastomas that are either primary or secondary. We have astrocytomas that are either isocitrate dehydrogenase mutated or wild type and I'm hoping that And here's where I think the GBM classification can get a little tricky with all these biomarkers and cytogenetics. So we've included a diagram from Nature Reviews Neurology for you to follow along with in our blog. But Nina, before you even physically have this tissue and before you've made this diagnosis, when do you begin to suspect a GBM in a patient? So typically you've discovered a patient has a mass, usually on imaging, usually incidentally. So, often asymptomatic, maybe they've had a little headache, or maybe they've had a seizure, or some progressive weakness, or even vision impairment. And you get the MRI, and it shows something that's really concerning. Most of them are pretty easy to suspect at diagnosis. a heterogeneous mass, often with a necrotic center. Preferred locations are really anywhere except the posterior fossa in adults. Many cross the midline. They extend into the splenium, and they would distinguish themselves from a secondary tumor by that. Some of them may have calcification within them, and that might be a hint that this arose from a lower-grade neoplasm. So this would be the IDH1 mutated secondary glioblastomas. I want to emphasize one group that's a particularly worrisome one, and that might be somebody who presents with a seizure is in his 40s, so a relatively younger age group for the high-grade glial tumors, and who has no enhanced on his MRI. That person still needs a biopsy and, if possible, a resection because of a certain percentage, albeit the minority, of patients with high-grade glial tumors will have no enhancement on their MRI scan. So the fact that there's no breakdown of blood-brain barrier does not mean that it's necessarily a low-grade tumor. The first-line therapy is to go to the OR and have the mass resected, and then the pathologists come back with a report that gives you both a genotype and kind of phenotype of the mass, and that gives you a World Health Organization or WHO classification or group, and from there on, you have a lot of data. You have a lot of information to share with the patient regarding their prognosis and their response to treatment um, to, taken together with both the molecular mutations, the actual um, grading of the tumor, as well as their age and other demographic factors. The next step is concurrent chemoradiation. Usually the uh, first-line agent, according to the STOOP regimen, is uh, temozolomide along with concurrent radiation. And once you have the tissue, now you get the biomarkers from pathology. So let's say we have a low-grade histology and we have an IDH mutant. And both of these are favorable markers with low grade indicating slow growth and fewer mitotic events, and IDH mutants having a dramatically extended survival compared to wild-type IDH. Mutations in IDH are associated with a significantly improved prognosis compared to tumors with normal or wild-type IDH. The majority of glioblastomas are unfortunately IDH wild-type, though 10% can be IDH mutants. 
We then look to see whether there is another abnormality called the 1P19Q co-deletion. So this is another molecular marker for glioma. The presence of IDH mutation along with 1P19Q co-deletion is essentially diagnostic of what used to be called an oligodendroglioma. And that has the best prognosis among all of the glial tumor types. Oligos are the ones that can look large and calcified on head CT often located in the frontal and temporal lobes, very often they present with seizures, and they have that classic fried egg appearance on histopathology. You can also have a low-grade glioma that's IDH mutated, but has atrix loss, and so that's a characteristic of many astrocytic tumors, and TP53 mutations, which are also characteristic of astrocytic tumors. So that would be a diffuse astrocytoma IDH mutant. So now we have two groups of IDH mutated uh, cell types that are astrocytoma and oligodendroglioma. Let's turn to the glioblastomas. There are now several different types of glioblastomas. We can have older people over age 65 or so who are going to have more like a seven-month survival, whereas the uncommon secondary glioblastoma with IDH mutation could have as much as a three-year survival expectation. Again, that may not sound like very much, but for the patient hearing these days, That's a pretty important difference. So glioblastoma, in turn, can be divided into IDH-mutated and IDH-wild type. Nina, we keep coming back to this IDH-mutant and wild type thing. What is it about IDH that's so important? So IDH1 and 2 or isocitrate dehydrogenase, you might remember from high school cell biology lessons where you learned about the citric acid cycle. Mutations in these enzymes, which are present throughout all glial cells, actually produce high amounts of a metabolite, which inhibits the function of gene-regulating enzymes. These can activate oncogenes and inactivate tumor suppressor genes. Interesting. So as I'm looking at this biomarker flowchart, the next thing I see after you've determined the IDH status is if the tumor is MGMT positive or negative. MGMT is a DNA repair protein, and therefore it reverses the damage done by alkylating chemotherapeutic agents like the ones that we use in the two major regimens for primary tumors, uh, procarbazine, CCNU, and vincristin, and timozolamide, the oral alkylating agent that's used in most protocols. Aberrant MGMT gene promoter methylation results in gene silencing, decreased expression of MGMT, and decreased ability of the tumor cells to repair DNA damage. You can imagine then that people who have MGMT promoter methylation will be rather more responsive to PCV chemotherapy or to timozolamide therapy. There are landmark studies. All right, so to review all of this, IDH mutant status is a positive prognostic marker, and abnormal MGMT methylation increases your response to alkylating chemotherapies things like timozolamide. But even before you start a patient on this medication, these patients are almost always put on corticosteroids, right? Why does neurosurgery like to do this? Many glioblastoma patients are on dexamethasone or decadron. This is usually used to attenuate the effects of vasogenic edema, which often comes along with the mass itself um, postoperatively after the mass is resected, or in the setting of pseudoprogression or progression. Neuro-oncologists typically like using dexamethasone as opposed to prednisone as it has minimal mineralocorticoid activity. I did not know that about dexamethasone. And something else that I didn't know about dex until just reading it is that compared to prednisone, dex carries a slightly lower risk of immunosuppression, and it's supposed to also have fewer cognitive side effects, right? Correct. Those are some of the main side effects of this malignancy that you may not see with other malignancies that you would like to avoid. And then we have our radiation therapy, which comes with its own host of complications. The conventional classification of radiation-related uh, side effects includes acute radiation changes, subacute, meaning at about six weeks, and then the chronic adverse effects. For people beginning radiation therapy with glioblastomas, uh, they're usually on steroids. And that will mitigate some of the acute effects. If people begin radiation without any steroid at all, by about the third or fourth week, radiation-induced swelling can often cause the need to increase the steroids even further. So I usually leave people on a lowish dose of dexamethasone, the smallest dose that will control their symptoms. Uh, some time out from the radiation, people continue to feel very tired. Um, and that's not too surprising. What should the neurologist be looking for? 
Well, first you should be looking to see whether you've withdrawn the steroids too quickly. And there's a small percentage of people whose neuraxa simply doesn't kick back in. And at three, four, six months out from their radiation therapy, they're actually adrenally insufficient. And they call you up and they say, I'm tired. And so you have to think, what is that 8 a.m. cortisol? And not so much people who then begin to have longer-term radiation-related adverse effects. Now, it's nice that we can talk about longer-term radiation effects altogether, honestly. Before, a couple of years ago, there weren't enough two-year survivors to say much about what the chronic adverse effects of radiation are. And they, unfortunately, are numerous. So there is the small vessel ischemic disease that occurs and progresses with people. There can be a diffuse leukoencephalopathic changes. There can be a very confusing picture of radiation necrosis, which actually may look like and confuse the examiner with recurrent tumor. And, and finally, there is that group of long-term survivors, but you don't get away with a glioblastoma and its cytotoxic therapies so easily. Virtually none of our long-term survivors is without significant cognitive effects, and some of those may have been from the primary tumor, but some of those are us, and that's mostly radiation more than chemotherapy. So, we have surgery, radiation, dexamethasone, and the oral alkylating agent temozolomide for your GBM patient and several biomarkers. But which treatment options should you choose, and when, and what are the complications of these treatments? We'll get to that in a minute, after this short break. The Brainwaves podcast is supported in part by Audible, the world's largest collection of ad-free audiobooks. Now that Game of Thrones is back on HBO, you might want to listen to the original novels by George R. R. Martin, some of which are narrated by the author himself. Just go to audibletrial.com slash brainwaves, and you can listen to your first book for free. Then, it's less than 15 bucks a month to keep the subscription going. So check it out at audibletrial.com slash brainwaves. So the current first-line regimen dates back to the landmark studies of Stoop and colleagues, that's S-T-U-P-P, uh, dating back to 2005. So for the last 12 years, the standard of the care has been chemoradiation, that is to say, maximal debulking of the tumor, and prognosis is both age and extent of resection related. So you go to a surgeon who's willing to get good neuroradiologic input and take out as much of the tumor as possible. Following resection, the patient then receives chemo radiation. He gets a specific dose of temozolomide just before his daily radiation, five days out of seven. It's usually about six weeks to 60 gray total, sometimes a little bit less depending on the age of the patient. Then the patient will receive... And then following this short course, six weeks, of combination therapy and radiation, the patient's typically treated with six to eight months more of temozolomide but it's a little more spaced out and tolerable to the patient. What do you have to worry about when they're taking so much of this kind of an alkylating therapy? So patients, while they're on Temodar, will feel profoundly fatigued and exhausted. That's kind of the main side effect. As I was mentioning before, this actually is a pretty benign drug as chemotherapy drugs go. People have a little bit of nausea. It's usually treated with conventional antiemetics. Um, it doesn't have too many interactions with any many other drugs. It can cause uh, significant myelosuppression. So you have to be on the lookout for leukopenia, pancytopenia, thrombocytopenia, and the side effects of those thereof. The peak time for a thrombocytopenia and leukopenia occurs at about three weeks. Some patients may require Bactrim prophylaxis if they are profoundly leukopenic to prevent life-threatening pneumonias and other infections. Our worry is that if people remain on this drug for a long period of time, like any immunosuppressive agent, we may be asking for trouble in the form of other neoplasms. At this point, they're so rare as to be just case reports, but there are some cases of secondary neoplasms. I would say that when your patients think about all the awful things that can happen on chemotherapy, like a chemotherapy-related polyneuropathy or cognitive changes and things, this drug ranks pretty well tolerated among them. That, again, it includes older patients who represent more than half of the patients with glioblastoma. Kind of interesting that for such a benign drug, it should make you question whether giving higher doses or more prolonged therapy might actually help these patients, especially given the dramatically shortened life expectancy for patients with glioblastoma. But it turns out, longer therapy doesn't equate to a longer life. 
there's no evidence that intensifying the dose to daily chemotherapy or extending the period of months during which the patient receives temozolomide makes any difference in overall survival. So what does this mean? At survival, there has been a slight improvement with the chemotherapy regimen I just mentioned, temozolomide and, and radiation therapy, to about 16 to 18 months across the board. Of the methylated... Patients are monitored very closely during this time with every three months or even monthly MRIs to look for a progression or recurrence of the mass. The next step, if there is recurrence of the mass, would be re-resection, um, followed by second-line chemotherapies and agents. This could include uh, repeat trials of Temodar or several other newer agents. When the tumor recurs, um, I should say that there is actually no FDA-approved specific regimen for recurrent high-grade tumors like glioblastomas. One regimen that is used is the vascular endothelial growth factor inhibitor, Bevacizumab. Bevacizumab is used at recurrence and has been FDA approved for this purpose. It was felt among our oncology groups that this was going to be a very exciting upfront drug as well. And unfortunately, in 2014, two separate studies made it very clear that overall survival was not impacted and quality of life was improved in only one of those two studies and negatively impacted in the other. These were very disappointing data, but there is no indication for Bevacizumab bevacizumab up front. Makes you kind of wonder, if bevacizumab doesn't prolong survival, and it at best may improve quality of life a little bit, why was it approved by the FDA for the treatment of GBM? One very important thing that it does is reduce the steroid requirement. It decreases vasogenic edema, which is one of the hallmarks of things on the MRI diagnosis of glioblastoma and one of the major things that trebles the volume and the trouble of symptoms that patients have. So bevacizumab is really good for that. But as with almost every other treatment, there are some risks that are associated with this particular therapy. One of the big ones is the risk for venous thromboembolism and or arterial ischemic or hemorrhagic stroke. Turns out that the risk is relatively low, but one needs to pay very careful attention to hypertension, which can occur during this period, and to the possibility of cytopenias such as thrombocytopenia that might increase the risk of cerebral bleeding. Anticoagulation for a patient with venous thromboembolism is not contraindicated in patients with glioblastoma and in patients with glioblastoma who are on bevacizumab. So that's one of the big adverse effects. Another that I know our group always thinks of is, is this PRESS, posterior reversible encephalopathy syndrome? And indeed, it will go away when the blood pressure is controlled and the drug withdrawn. Perhaps less well-known, although not less well-known among surgeons, is that wound healing is a problem. Wound healing um, is such a problem on this drug that we would try to avoid any surgery, and that includes craniotomy, within 30 days of the use of bevacizumab. Other things that happen are hypothyroidism, a host of fatigue-related effects, which I can't really explain, but when a patient on bevacizumab says he's tired, he really is. And I don't want to neglect the financial toxicity of the drug. After several doses of this drug... Uh, we can prolong life and decrease steroid requirement for about four months, and that's at the cost of about $10,000 per dose. Wow. That's kind of a lot to consider when you're thinking about bevacizumab. And from the provider's perspective, one thing that I usually struggle with in patients with GBM is when they worsen. There is a period of time somewhere between a month and three months out from radiation, when because of the interaction of radiation and probably the temozolomide as well, there's a phenomenon that we call pseudoprogression. So Nina, you get this follow-up MRI and it shows interval vasogenic edema or maybe even growth of the primary neoplasm. How do you know if the patient's worsening because of the natural progression of the disease or if it's due to this phenomenon of pseudoprogression? And what is pseudoprogression? well-described phenomenon uh, in patients with glioblastomas. And honestly, the answer is usually a little bit of both. It's usually some pseudoprogression and perhaps some progression of the mass itself. And this is best looked at on serial imaging. Um, particularly, the radiologists look for nodularity within the tumor resection bed. Um, there are specific MRI scans that are more sensitive to distinguish between pseudoprogression and progression. Like MR-SPECT. Yes. 
Correct. Um, and those are the kind of the things that both neurosurgery and oncology follows. The scan looks worse. It looks like the patient has failed chemotherapy. That's a mistake to interpret it that way. About 30 or 40% of people will have something that looks like this. And indeed, unfortunately, about half of those may actually have progression, but the other half will be better a month later or six weeks later when you do another scan. So important to remember the phenomenon of pseudo progression on chemo radiation. But when patients actually progress, that's when the neuro-oncologist should consider adjusting the treatment regimen. So I think this is something that neurologists need to know. It's often the patients will return to the person who made the initial diagnosis and say, what now? You know, it's seven or eight months later, which is an average time, unfortunately, to uh, progression. And he's had another seizure or he's had a new deficit or the scan has shown something asymptomatically. As I mentioned before, there are no approved regimens, but some of the things that you're going to be hearing about are retreatment with temozolomide, use of a different alkylating agent such as CCNU or BCNU by itself, and and then a couple of more interesting things that are investigational. There are the tumor treating fields that you can apply low intensity, medium frequency fields directly to the skull. Other types of ideas about how to treat this devastating illness include dendritic cell vaccines, the CAR T technology, and also, most interestingly, pembrolizumab, which is one of the PD1 inhibitors trying to engage the patient its own immune system to fight against the tumors. By now, we've covered a lot of ground on the treatment and the complications of treatment for patients with glioblastoma. For those of you who haven't given up on this unconventionally lengthier episode, what we haven't discussed, however, and what we should at least briefly acknowledge before we wrap up are the complications of GBM itself and how neurologists manage these symptoms. Dr. Pruitt, now we've talked a lot about the treatment of GBMs themselves, but what about the complications of GBMs, particularly cognitive changes or even seizures? We tend to use the L drugs, levetiracetam, lecosamide, and if we had time, we'd probably use lamotrigine, but it just takes too long to build this up in most people. So other things that we neurologists ought to be supervising would be a sudden change in symptoms. Why might that happen? It could happen because the patient had sudden bleed into an area and how to manage that and whether or not to continue bevacizumab or other chemotherapy agents would be an important decision. The other thing that could happen is that there's a sudden obstruction somewhere. So acute hydrocephalus is sometimes an indication for shunting in our patients, and I wouldn't hesitate to do so. Dr. Pruitt, well, as usual, I found this extremely helpful and informative. What I'm taking away from this talk is that we've made dramatic strides in the management of GBM and other primary glial tumors. Biomarkers provide key prognostic information in both the prognostic and uh, treatment aspects of these tumors, and management is supportive and can involve alkylating agents like Temodar or stereotactic radiosurgery. Neurologists should be aware of all the major complications of GBM. I guess I'm glad to say that we have some long-term survivors, um, but we're going to have to do better to uh, maximize uh, the quality of life in these survivors. Again, that was Dr. Nia Shrile and Amy Pruitt discussing the features, the complications, and the management of glioblastoma multiforme. Our thoughts and prayers go out to Senator John McCain and his family as he goes through these next few months or years. It's definitely not easy. Thanks to everybody out there listening. We hope you're able to take something away from this talk. Today's episode of Brainwaves was produced by me with the help from Nina Chirail, music courtesy of Axel, Cold Noise, Josh Woodward, and Kelly Latimer. I'm Jim Siegler. Thanks for tuning in. So I think that was pretty conversational. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Okay.